Hello everybody, I'm Logan Crawford and this is the award-winning TV talk show right here on Ebru Fresh Outlook. A pool party in the Dallas, Texas area makes news around the world. People point to a viral video as proof that the end of school year event is another example of white cops brutalizing black people. In this case, a 14-year-old girl clad only in a bikini. She is seen being manhandled by a police officer as she tries to elude arrest. The incident resulted in the officer resigning days later. Take a listen to what some officials had to say about that. Ace Bolt has resigned from the McKinney Police Department. As the chief of police, I want to say to our community that the actions of Case Bolt, as seen on the video of the disturbance at the community pool, are indefensible. Our policies, our training, our practice do not support his actions. He came into the call out of control and as the video shows, was out of control during the incident. I had 12 officers on the scene, and 11 of them performed according to their training. They did an excellent job. The actions of anyone. I am joined now by the Ebru Think Tank, Alan Sanders, political science professor at St. Peter's University. Yuhuru Williams, vice president of academic affairs at Fairfield University. And Kevin Calagero from the NYPD. He is retired now. He works in the private sector as a private investigator on environmental issues. Kevin, I'll start with you because you've been in the field. You are sent to a pool party because of a disturbance, a report of one woman attacking another woman. You go there, there's a bunch of kids taunting you, it seems from the video. What do you do? Well, first off, you try to maintain your cool. And the first thing you do when you get to any situation is just because it was called in as one thing doesn't mean that that's what you're going to come up upon. So you need to assess the situation and look around and make sure what it is. You've seen the video. If you arrived on the scene, would your actions have been different than Officer Casebolt? At one point, he actually even does a barrel roll, uh, almost commando style, if you will. Uh, I think that every officer handles things differently. I probably would have chosen a different route than what he did. Um, in this day and age, I think one of the problems is that a lot of these police officers are pulling up on situations, and with everything that's going on, they're very cautious and sometimes I guess they're a little bit apt to be maybe overreact on that situation. But wouldn't you possibly even be slow to get out of the car knowing what the climate is nowadays with white cops constantly being accused of wrongdoing against black people? Uh, I think, once again, you need to assess every situation when you get out of the car. And uh, I think with everything that's been going on, on around the nation, you know, uh, police are a little more on guard. They're a little more skeptical about what they're walking into. And uh, I think, you know, nerves run a little deep. We're still dealing with human beings, even though they're police officers. So they react. Uh, but we're going to talk to you more yeah. about the tape in just a second. Let's turn to Alan. Alan, what's your reaction to this video? Well, I do agree with the police chief that this is a policeman out of control. To me, the most troubling aspect of it is that he drew his revolver. Uh, that's really dangerous. Uh, if you look at the video, lots of people were surrounding him, and he's sort of waving the pistol uh, every which way, and that's uh, potential for great, great harm. I mean, I don't quite approve with him the way he manhandled uh, the, the, young, the young girl, but that at least, it doesn't pose that much of a danger or seems a little less dangerous. But waving the gun uh, in a situation where uh, there are lots of people around, and, and he, it, you know, he was manhandling at the same time. If you're the officer gun. and you're being menaced by a group of teenagers, what would you do? Not clearly. He's being menaced. If you've had, well, if, they're taunting him and throwing things towards you, him. It looks like they're whipping towels at him and things like that. But that's not a basis for drawing a gun. And so I think that's the real problem. And that's what, I'm in my view, is out of control. Just a second, uh, Yahura, what, what are your thoughts on the video? Well, I agree, except that I, I believe that the officer's case bolt's actions toward the young lady were also very disturbing. And I think that's really what stirred up so much animosity across the nation, uh, particularly among communities of color. Looking at the way that he brutalized this young girl who's in a bikini, who clearly is not or does not pose a threat to him, uh, other than being taunting. Um, th the thing that's really disturbing about this, and I agree because I've had weapons training, is the fact that he pulled pulls the revolver uh, to begin with. I think the other officers did act exemplary. I mean, this is a, a, a circumstance where, in some sense, we can celebrate the way that the other officers behaved in calming him down. But it still forces us to really take a hard look at how police are trained, particularly in these circumstances. And I agree with Kevin. In the context of everything else that's going on, you would expect a certain degree of sensitivity coming into an environment like, like that. And you did not see that on a part of Case Bolt. 
Kevin, when he drew his gun, was he appropriate, in your opinion, in his actions to use his uh, service weapon at that point? I know you're not there, and I know there's <laughs> exactly. a lot being seen, exactly. a lot happening that can't even be seen on the perimeters of the exactly. video. Exactly, and I think that's up to the officer to make that decision. It appears, from what I've seen on the tape, and this is only an assumption on my part, uh, if I had 11 other officers with me and I was facing a crowd of young people that didn't seem to be threatening, even though they might have been taunting, you know, I probably would have not done the same thing. Right. So there's a way, perhaps, to de-escalate this situation. Let this 14-year-old girl run home to her mother if she's screaming, I want mommy, I want mommy. You'll get her later, right? Possibly? But that was the problem, though, is that they came into a circumstance. Now we know, because we're, the, the uh, facts were now kind of filtering out, that you had a situation that there was a fight. The police came in and essentially began to throw everyone to the ground. At least this is what the youth are, are reporting. And so there's this immediate reaction on the part of the young people to run, to scatter. Right. Obviously, you would assume that police officers are going to think, well, if they're running, they may have been involved in some way in this altercation. And so there's all these misunderstandings, and layers of misunderstanding that contributed to the tragedy, or almost tragedy, because fortunately, no one was, you know, hurt or, or killed in this incident. I think, again, that's something we can take away from it. At least say this is not Ferguson in that, in that, that sense. Right. And I, I'm okay. also not sure that this is necessarily a racial incident. I think, I think it plays out on the video as a racial incident. But I think uh, uh, that officer probably, I mean, it's hard to know, probably would have behaved the same way if it was just a crowd of, of white, uh, white uh, teenagers just uh, overreacting. He seems to be reacting to the situation, not so much the racial component of the situation. Uh, and but I think it does, you're right, because they're polarizing <laughs> everything as a black right, and white issue. Right. But there, He's point. not using racial epithets. I don't think so. Uh, but of course, since you see a, a white officer, uh, you know, tackling a, a young white girl, uh, lots of people put a racial right. Uh, so and now every on. time, but are we going to use the reverse on that, Yuhuro? Every time a black person attacks a white person, it's because the white person was white. Well, and, and that's the problem is that when we look at Case Bolt's record, then that's where these allegations about racism really have uh, metastasized. And people are saying, look, if you look at uh, his reputation in the community, if you look at some of the previous arrests and what others have said about him, he had a reputation. And so, again, this invites a, a more, um, a deeper conversation about policing that, again, in the context of everything that's happening nationally, kind of puts the spotlight maybe unfairly on the McKinney police, but certainly not unfairly on the way that we uh, police uh, community. Uh, um, police neighborhoods of color. Right. It's sure. difficult with kids. We're going to get to some of the other national cases we've talked about. But when my son was a senior at UMass, there was a uh, party that got out of control. Cops showed up. They, he said, officer, he said, the officer said, sit down. He said, but when he said, but he was thrown face first into the ground. I mean, that's just how officers respond in a situation when um, young people are out of control, Kevin. I mean, because they have to, because my son could be a perfectly innocent kid or he could have a nine millimeter in his waistband. You need to assess when you get there and you need to make sure that you have control of the whole situation. That's what helps stop getting people from getting hurt. You know, if you don't have control of the situation when you come on, it's a problem, it creates more problems. And I think, I agree with the gentleman, I don't think this was a racial issue. I think if, depending upon what his record is, you need to look into, did the officer work black areas where he was going to have more arrests of black persons? You know, what areas did he work? What was his background? You know, were there charges of um, improper use of force against him? You know, those are the things I think you know, need to be looked at also. But. Let's talk about some of the other cases. Let's talk about Freddie Gray, which I think of all the recent examples is the most troubling. He got what they call a rough ride, apparently, in the back of a police car in the Baltimore area. Um, I see this resonating with you, Kevin. I'll get a load to everyone else. No racial issue there because Baltimore, 53% of the force is minority. The mayor is minority. The police chief is minority. Three of the officers that were locked up for this we're also a minority. So there's definitely no issue of, of racism there. I think the problem, once again, is a relationship between the police departments in the country and the residents, and there seems to be a disconnect. You know, officers are not there to fill a role of punisher. They're there to build a relationship with the community and work within that community. Let me just also change the channel just a little bit to a case that unfolded just today. A man pulled up to the Dallas police uh, headquarters in an armored vehicle and began firing with a high-powered weapon. Uh, fortunately, nobody was hurt in that incident. I believe the suspect is dead at this point. It's been reported that. I mean, so this is a brave new world, Yuhiro, that we're dealing with, right? Absolutely. No one wants to discount the 
enormous pressure that police officers face, officers uh, of the law face in this country. The problem is, and I do believe that McKinney is a racial um, incident. It's a racial incident primarily because of the context that um, it developed in. There were racial epithets that were shared back and forth before the police got there. There have been allegations about that department, allegations about many departments. Whether that's true or not is, again, something we need to investigate. But in this climate, and even in Baltimore, if you're talking about predominantly black police force, how do they police communities of color as opposed to uh, white citizens? These complaints routinely come out among communities of color. And as we saw in Baltimore, some of the things that uh, people say, people of color complain about, that people think are fictitious, the rough ride, the throwdown, like the taser incident in South Carolina. Here's evidence down on video that these things that people thought were out of you know, African American and Latinos fantasies actually do happen. And I think that's the real power of McKinney, is that this affirmation, again, in video, of what people have co constantly complained about in communities of color. Alan. Yeah, I, I would say a couple of things about Baltimore. Uh, for instance. I mean, I've been in situations where I've seen law enforcement officers, black law enforcement officers, come down harder on, um, on black people uh, in, in a particular situation than the white people who are in that particular situation. So I do think there's a racial component, and I think it's a much more complex problem than white officers versus black uh, uh, citizens. I think it's a, you need to take a look at the whole concept of the police perception, whether the policeman is black, white, Hispanic, or whatever, of minority communities. And so I think you need a lot more sensitivity training, you need a lot more discussion, uh, and you need a lot more facts. And I also think, as uh, the media covers every single one of these disparate incidents, you really have to look very closely at the particular facts because um, the precipitating incident may not be the whole picture or the actual uh, violence may not be the whole picture. So you've got a whole complex uh, set of factors here. What is the police, regardless of the race of the police, what is the police attitudes towards minority communities? And secondly, uh, whatever you see on video, whatever you see on tape, whatever you see reported, you really have to wait and go a lot deeper and take a look at the whole context. So uh, both of those components, of course, don't make for good television necessarily um, and and so it's a much more complex issue but what television does do is it highlights that we have a problem yeah. and now that we know that we have a problem we have to get down to the business of really looking into it much more deeply Kevin do you have any solutions I mean it seems like I said we're living in a brave new world where uh, cops are facing dire threats their heads are being hacked off in their patrol cars in New York City they're being fired on with automatic weapons in uh, Dallas Texas uh, they're being murdered in other parts of the country um, and yet we have a president who says they're viewed as an occupying force. And, you know, maybe both things are true. Maybe both they're coming under high, um, maybe they're being assassinated while also being perceived as an occupying force. What are your thoughts? I think that society needs to think about structure, you know, and what do you do if you don't have a police department? I mean, the thin blue line is really there. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's the line between anarchy, it's a line be between being able to walk into your house or walk out of your house without being accosted, you know, or having burglaries. So, you know, there needs to be a police force there. And how it interacts is, I think, what, you know, gentlemen's talking about with maybe a little more public awareness of what the police job is. But, but Kevin also isn't part of it that being a policeman at times is a dirty business. I'm not saying dirty, illegal, but let's say I did something wrong right now and you had to arrest me. The act of you arresting me, if I resisted, would be violent, perhaps extremely violent, right? Yes. And years ago, all right, if somebody told you, a police officer said to you 40, 50 years ago, you're under arrest, it stopped there. You were arrested. Mm -hmm. Turn around, you were handcuffed. Today, it seems to become confrontational. I don't understand what people don't understand about the words, you're under arrest. If you don't like that, that's fine. You can have recourse later on. Well, I think they're getting mixed messages, and I'll give this to you, Yehuro, even from the president, that perhaps the cops are wrong in many of these instances, and it's giving people who are viewed as suspects um, the backbone to perhaps stand up to the cops in the street when they shouldn't, they should bring it to the court of law. Well, the assumption is that police are operating as a lawful authority and that we all are bound. Um, it's our civic duty to obey that authority. And that the best place to work out those differences is in the courts or after the uh, situation is de-escalated. Yes. I agree about the, the thin blue line, but the problem is that in that scenario, and it's very true, the police have, an, uh, have a larger responsibility because ultimately the state has a monopoly on violence. They're deputized to carry arms. And so we expect more of our police officers. We expect them to behave in a professional manner. And when they don't, people, people rightfully feel betrayed. They rightfully feel justified in, in expressing anger. Having said that, Kevin is absolutely right. 
that is a real uh, situation that we face and we don't have a civil society if we don't have police that we can trust in and structures that we can trust in that are going to operate on our behalf. Complex issues. Here's one that's not really. Two guys who are clearly murderers. One dismembered his boss. Guess what? They're loose because someone in the prison helped them break out, allegedly. We'll have more on that after this.